Strange Shadows, a Clark Ashton Smith podcast. Greetings, friends, and welcome to Season 1, Episode 18 of Strange Shadows, the Clark Ashton Smith podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Rob Poynton. And I'm the other one, Tim Mendes. And yeah, this show is basically a wrap-up of Season 1. We'll be looking back over recurring themes, our favourite words, and all that kind of good stuff. And we also have a couple of guests, don't we, Rob? Yes, we do. We're very pleased to welcome Mark Griffin and Richard Wilson from the 30 Plus Minutes with HP Lovecraft podcast. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Hello, hello. hello. Thanks for long, having us. Long-time listener, first-time guest. Nice, lovely, lovely. But before we get into all that Smithian stuff, uh, we've got a bit of an announcement to make, haven't we, Tim? Oh, we do. And yeah, I've got to stop my voice going all high-pitched and excited. <laughs> so I might let you do it. <laughs> Just... <laughs> do you want my stentorian tones? Yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> Well, as you may know, Tim and I and Shelley de Cruz from Graveheart Designs are in the process of organising the Innsmouth Literary Festival, which is going to be a, a Lovecraftian Weird Tales convention. Uh, it's going to be held September the 30th in Bedford, UK. And we're now very pleased to announce that we have as our special honoured guest, Mr. Ramsey Campbell, who's going to be making a live Zoom uh, appearance for questions, uh, a chat, uh, and an interview, basically. So we're really pleased with that. Of course, we've got some other guests lined up as well, uh, as well as some gaming people and traders and everything else. But that's our big news. We're going to be speaking live to Ramsey Campbell. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a... <laughs> people who've listened to any of my interviews about my own work will know that he's pretty much one of the biggest influences aside from Lovecraft. Um, the reason I decided to make my own milieu and all the rest of it was because of the interaction between Ramsey Campbell and August Derleth. So yeah, I'm going to be doing the Wayne's World thing. I'm going to be, <laughs> I was saying just before we come on that, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an elastic band on and do that whole attic thing and snap it every time I'm a massive <laughs> fanboy. So We are not worthy. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, we will be getting details out shortly of how you can book tickets for the event as well. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, so let's get back into our volume one, the end of the story, and welcome our guests again, Mark and Richard. So perhaps, guys, you could start with telling us a little bit about what you do and also how you got into Smith and what do you like about Smith? Uh, well, we started a podcast during COVID about Lovecraft, and uh, we got um, in, if you start studying Lovecraft, you eventually fall into Clark Ashton Smith. You know, he, he, you can't help but run into him. And he was, you know, he's regarded as kind of like, you know, one of the trilogies of like weird fiction, you know, with uh, Robert E. Howard being the third one. And, and But he was one I was least familiar with. And so, you know, I was kind of like, you know, trying to read his stuff and basically trying to struggle with it and, and all that. And so it's like, um, I just had a hard time getting into his, like, you know, writing and uh, found y'all's podcast. And it's helped me a lot, really, to get into him. Oh, nice. Thanks. How's that for a testimonial? That's great. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Ringing endorsement. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll be using that in the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was a whole ethos behind it, really, wasn't it, Rob? Because both Rob and I are like really into it. And uh, we're kind of like, more people should be into it. <laughs> so that was kind of the whole. So that's great. I mean, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when I start trying to read his stuff, it's probably almost like daydreaming because, you know, his words uh, are almost like really ethereal. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. like, and, and um, you know, with, with you know, all like, you know, descriptions and, you know, how the stories are and all this helped me give, it, give me more of a foundation, you know, that was just when reading them. And I think for me, certainly, I, I read, I mean, I've got a certain amount, the old pa Panther paperback of Smith and, um, you know, but there's a lot of stories here that I hadn't read before as well. I mean, some weren't even really printed, were they, Tim? Uh, I certainly weren't widely distributed anyway. No. So that, that's been a real pleasure as well reading a lot of new stories or new for me same for me because a lot of them weren't in any of his collections because i mean like the especially the panther ones which were the the widely printed ones in the united kingdom they were all like the lost worlds and there was the hyperborea one and so it, it was kind of like the the core ones i mean some of the stories you know i'd never even heard of that we yeah. read and some of them have been absolute gold you know yeah 
And how did you guys get into setting up your podcast? What's the story behind that? We I need something to keep myself preoccupied during the COVID. Yeah, we had a lot of spare time during the pandemic as far as you know, just something to do. And then technology <laughs> has allowed, you know, to be able to even if you're isolated in different, you know, your own homes and that type of thing through FaceTime and Zoom, all that type of thing, as far as all you gotta do is be able to get three, four people or whatever, however many people, you know, in a on a Zoom call together and start talking about in this case Lovecraft and there you go. And he first just at first it started like almost like giving like little reports about like certain sort of segments of his life. And I started mainly with his childhood. And then um I had been in contact with Josie and um so I like ended up like him you know, making him our first guest that we had in our show for one year anniversary. Oh wow. And then like after that we just I decided to keep having guests because I'd much rather have other people talk about Lovecraft and <laughs> let them do the heavy. Yeah. I can I can talk to them directly about what questions I have. <laughs> but it's nice. I mean, it's something we said before. If there's two or three of you, you get two or three different perspectives on the story, and each person picks up something that another person might have missed or interprets Absolutely. it a different way. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the fun about having other people around. You know, they definitely give you very different ideas of things. Yeah, that's different perspectives. And I guess with Lovecraft, there's an awful lot of scholarship now as well. Yeah. A huge... I feel like Lovecraft is almost like infinity. You know, you just can't just like just start reading him. It's like almost like, you know, you, there's all these rabbit holes you can fall into of Lovecraft. You know, it's like in what Clark Cash and Smith, Robert E. Howard, you know, and like in all the other things, you know, even like really obscure writers, you know, like Robert Block or Edith Miniter, you know, and yeah, you know, like there's all these little things you could fall into. You know, you'd study him for almost like forever, and it seemed like you always would know something new about him. And I just find that fascinating about Lovecraft. You know, it's like because I, I thought I knew who Lovecraft was until COVID happened. And then I just happened to have the, um, <laughs> the biography that that was Frank the Cam wrote. I know a lot of people really hate that biography, but I loved it. And, um, I don't agree with everything he wrote in it, but I, it definitely opened my eyes to what he. Lovecraft was and you know it's like and just everything I thought I knew about him was completely wrong so and, and I thought I read everything by him I found it I hadn't especially his collaborations and his ghost works and so you know started like digging that stuff and you know and then there was his essays and then his letters you know it was almost like he kept going you know you know he's almost like the Tupac of weird fiction you know so he's just, he's just, <laughs> where is this new material coming from yeah I've I've always thought of Lovecraft as kind of like the dandelion of weird fiction. It's like you know you blow that dandelion clock and all the seeds go everywhere. It's like you look through mm -hmm. everything. There's a little seed of Lovecraft in it, you know. In, oh, in most yeah. of most yeah. not just fiction, video games, TV, films, yeah. you can see little little seeds of Lovecraft. It's like you know that was. That's kind of how I see yeah, it. Yeah, because because that's how I got into Lovecraft to begin with when I was younger was not the actual the core stories, but it's the perfiloration in other media, yeah. like Doctor Strange comics, you know, and role playing games and Metallica songs and like that. It's like a, and then it all corps back to like, oh, it's all from this guy. <laughs> yeah. so all, all roads lead to Lovecraft kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh -huh. And I think it was, I think for me, it's that idea of we came out of the, the classic ghost era, the sort of M.R. James, Edwardian stuff, which obviously Lovecraft was big into. But he, he, he didn't really use a lot of supernatural stuff in his literature. No. I always think it's interesting that he's put out there as like a horror writer or a, a, a ghost writer. But actually, it's, it's almost, as we say on the Innsworth Book Club, it's science fiction, a lot of it. Yeah. There were a few, like I just call it little ghost stories. There was one like the dollhouse where a guy was like having a dollhouse and he was witnessing like a, a reenactment of a murder that happened. Mm. Yeah. And all that. But yeah. that's the one I can remember the most by M.R. James. Yes. And yeah. Wasn't there a movie, Night of the Demons, something like that? I don't know the one. Yeah, Night of the Demon was uh, cast in the runes, was uh, an adaptation of that. It was a TV adaptation as well that was quite good. Yes. In uh, I think it was in the 80s. There's been several TV. I mean, the, the whole ghost stories for Christmas. We don't want to get into that debacle. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's been on the MR James <laughs> forums lately, oh no. Yeah. But um, yeah. But there was uh, there was also that odd. Um, I don't think Dario Dario Argento actually directed it. 
but he was involved in it the church one of the gallo films that was uh the treasure of abbot thomas oh right uh, well there's certainly been uh i think the james adaptations have been more successful than the lovecraft adaptations on the whole with a few exceptions uh and when it comes to smith adaptations there's virtually nothing there so as far as we've been able to find out wasn't there, there are about three no, think, re, the return of the sorcerer in the, yeah, the night gallery thing there's a yeah. night gallery yeah. episode yeah. night gallery um i forget it's like a richard stanley did an uh a one for um it was mother of toads for the yeah theater mm. bizarre which, or whatever it was yeah. yeah i went to sleep and there was a short adaptation of the final incantation which I still haven't managed to find. <laughs> You're not tracking that one. No, I, yeah. I, no, yeah. I've, I've been trying to get hold of that for months, and I can't get hold of it. Is that the one? It's like a, they have a Kickstarter, like you know, like saying, "Hey, we're we just need a little bit more money, get this done." You know? Yeah, and apparently it got released, but pff, I can't find it. <laughs> I've been scouring the internet, and I cannot find it. The lost film. I've heard there's one. I think it's called the Double Shadow. That um. It's like I mentioned IMDb, and um, but I can't find anything about that, you know, like anything more than what was just there. And it just like just mentioned it existed, but that was about it. There was also Full Seas, um, Dead trilogy, like um, The Beyond, City of the Living Dead. Um, those specifically, they were influenced by Smith, they weren't direct adaptations, but obviously, you had the Book of Ebon in there. and um, they were kind of, and that sort of dreamlike quality. I see Rob glazing over because he isn't a fan. <laughs> <laughs> He's checked out. <laughs> I am. I am a fan of Fawcett, but he is one of those directors. He's kind of marmite. You either love him or hate him. And we're the two sides of the coin here. I love him. He hates him. <laughs> we are. We are. There's not. There's not much we disagree on. But that's... <laughs> no. Yeah. Um. We just watched Beyond about a few months ago. Oh, from Beyond. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And as well as uh oh, what's the other one? Uh Miskatonic University, the 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 resonator, <laughs> which is basically the CW version yeah. of which <laughs> like the you know, young, pretty young people or whatever like that, you're messing with the eldritch unknown and that kind of thing. <laughs> that kind of that kind of take on from beyond. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That was recently. Yeah, The Resonator, Miskatonic U. I've got a copy of it, but I still haven't brought myself to watch it because I know it's going to be dreadful. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, it's got its moments. It's no from beyond, but, you know. <laughs> it's not great, but it's, yeah. it's a formal entertainment movie. You know? yeah. okay. It's something we speculated on a few times during the season is why, because I think in many ways, Smith was the best writer out of the three on a, perhaps we could say, on a technical level. Um, yeah. Or yeah. they, well, they all had different qualities, and Smith seems to be the most forgotten or overlooked of the three. Uh, is that because Robert E. Howard had like a Conan and a Solomon Kane, and and Smith didn't really have any sort of characters as such, mm. or ones I guess that, that took off, like his or he got enmeshed in you know the consciousness the way that Conan or you know like a Cthulhu or that kind of thing did, as far as you know, like oh, who created this thing? You know, like was this? You know, yeah, he doesn't really have that. You know, that, that character. Yeah. Well, it's interesting the block, um, because, I mean, at the, that time, he was known for his Lovecraftian fiction. I mean, he wrote quite a lot. Um, it, it, most of it is collected in the Chaosian book, Mysteries of the Worm, and it's really good stuff. But he only got known later with Psycho. Um, I often wonder if Smith would have had that breakout story a lot of more people would talk about him because I mean he had characters that recurred, but not many. Mm. I, I wonder if that was the thing, because obviously you had the recurrence of like Yogg Thoth and Cthulhu, and obviously he had his Conan. So I think Rob's probably hit the nail on the head there. Aside from Satan Zeros and that that Captain Captain, Captain Douchebag or whatever he was, <laughs> you know the one who the one who left all this crew, the one who yeah, marooned in Andromeda, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Aside from that, there was no real recurrence. Uh, I mean, the only recurring thing was South Okura, really. Um, and some of his other Lovecraftian deities. But I think they were used more by Lovecraft than they were by Smith. Yeah. So, or there's, and as a result, they're associated with Lovecraft more. So, yeah. 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 Even then, I suppose it's Smith 
Smith's Cthulhu Mythos monsters, isn't it? <laughs> Rather than mm. you yeah. know, they get yeah. subsumed into the the Lovecraftian yeah. hole, though, which is quite Lovecraftian, really. <laughs> well, that was my introduction. I hadn't read really all that much of his stuff, and then Mark let me borrow what is it the uh, the Clark Ashton cycle, which is all like the Cthulhu type stories and that type of thing. And that was you know where I was like, oh yeah, these are really good. Brilliant book. Yeah, I think that was the same for Brilliant me. Yeah, book. yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely came to it through or came to him through Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, I think I think how I got into him was on the back of the paperback. So I used to spend a lot of time scouring through them. You know, them cardboard boxes you used to find of paperbacks in the markets or bookshops. Yes. And I looked on the back and there was a Lovecraft quote on one of the Panther paperbacks. It was like Smith is brilliant kind of thing, you know. And uh and there was Belknap Long and Fritz Leiber, and I was like, right, buying that. <laughs> that's so i got into it like the same way it was through lovecraft but yeah that clark ashton cycle for anybody who wants a, a really good introduction to clark ashton smith's books i've often said that's the one that's i mean yeah it's such a great volume like all the chaosium stuff the supplementary stuff is also really interesting because you get like uh, uh i think it was robert m price wasn't it did all the uh, the introduction to all the stories and the big old yeah. biography and potted history. And so it's a really good introduction, I think. Yeah, he did a really good job with that, you know, in kind of explaining like and the inspirations. And it's interesting that, you know, yeah. Clark Ashton Smith would be inspired by one of Lovecraft's stories, but it wouldn't necessarily be like a knockoff. He would like do something completely different, you know, just use this almost like his little springboard, you know, to, you know, he, yeah. he was to do his own thing, you know, like, He'd read that and go like, "That's an interesting idea. I should do something else." With that you know, and and that's why it's so fascinating reading the letters between them as well. Uh, some of which are quite short and are kind of, uh, "Oh, we had some rain this week. Uh, I've just sent off the ghoul to Farnsworth Wright." And other ones, particularly the Lovecraft ones, are like fifteen pages without a break. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Lovecraft's letters; they are like novellas, aren't they? Some of them. I mean, blimey, I've got I've got a volume of his letters with August Derleth. They're probably even worse. <laughs> just like the pair of them, just like ramble on for page after page after page. But it's always really entertaining. <laughs> That's the thing. You know, he'll find interesting topics to discuss with people. I mean, he'll go into mm. ancient Greek history, you know, and it's like, and, and like, and some who go into hex symbols in Pennsylvania, you know, <laughs> so he might just, you know, a lot of way different subjects, you know, that we never expect, you know, Lovecraft to have. And it's definitely entertaining with Clark Ash and Smith because when they first start off, they're really formal, you know, they go like Mr. Smith, Mr. Lovecraft. Yes. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they start using like little nicknames they've given each other, you know, Clark Ash Tony, you know, like, H, yeah. H, P, H, L. Uh, yeah. and and it's the great return addresses you get sometimes from, from the nethermost abyss of the beyond. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna I was gonna say that that's the best thing about the letters by far. Yeah, I mean my favourite of the nicknames is Belknap Longs <laughs> that Lovecraft caught up with Frank Chime Sleep Short, <laughs> Chime Sleepius <laughs> for short. <laughs> I don't, it's always oh, it just always cracks me up. Yeah. One of the best ones was Robert E. Howard, Two Gun Bob. <laughs> Two Gun Bob. Yeah. It seems to a T, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So let's get into uh, looking over the last season then. We've covered, uh, say, all of the stories in the first volume. So it's the end of the story. And what we thought would be fun to do, as regular listeners will know, each episode we choose a, a favourite word or two or three, or sometimes four, from the story. So we thought it'd be fun to pick out a few of our favourite words from across the whole season. And uh, following that, perhaps a favourite line or a favourite phrase or something from one of the stories. So who would like to start us off with uh, a favourite word? I'll do it. I'll go first. And this is, I, I bet you can guess what I'm going to say. I've got a fairly good idea, but uh, it's the phallic. Yes, <laughs> you knew it, didn't you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is basically a statue with a woody, and uh, <laughs> the, the it's basically a phallus but on a statue. And uh, what I liked about that was when you delved into that, Rob, and you found the phobia. Yes, it's the phallophobia. It's the phallophobia. Yeah, it was a, it's a phobia of statues with erections. Yes. 
Yeah. I have to say, if I had to choose a phobia, I think that would that would probably one I'd choose because it <laughs> doesn't really impact your life that much, does it? It's not like claustrophobia or agoraphobia or something. You, know? <laughs> you got to have it. <laughs> I just, every time I play Arkham Horror, because uh, me and my partner are well into the living card game, and uh, every time, you know, you get the uh, the traumas, basically i keep expecting it <laughs> to go with like sedambulism and uh you know all the rest of it with the phallophobia <laughs> i'm gonna cheer if i get it but i don't think it's in the pack unfortunately perhaps a supplement will add it in or something i don't know oh man how about you mark what have you got there uh one of my favorites is um from the abominations of Yond- yondo londo uh mystery mystery arch um, so oh, we're sorry about that one. Someone who presides over a mystery. Yeah, the, the official mystery presider. Yeah. That's nice, isn't nice. it? Nice. Yeah. Just what a job title, eh? How does that come in a conversation? You know, it's like, you know, it's like so what do you do for a living? Well, <laughs> I'm a licensed mystery arch. Yeah. So. <laughs> I get the impression of a guy with a big sort of cloak or something, you know, it's like seven foot, I am mystery arch. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to have the big collar. The big collar with the suns and moons on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Richard, what, what are you choosing? I just like I like the phonetics of Nyctaloptic because I've seen that one in there as far as um, what is this the inability to see to see in dim light or at night or at night the night blindness, which I'm sure would make things far more you know terrifying for people in some of these. It does sound good, that doesn't it? It does sound like a sort of a, a creature or a being or something as well, doesn't it? It's... Yeah, it has this very cyclopean-ish, you know, type phonetics to it that it does appeal to me. I think the the sound is why I chose one of mine, which was Nefandus, which was in the Necromantic Tale, which uh, means blasphemous and not to be named or unnameable. Nefandus or Nefandus. <laughs> Again, as regular listeners will know, we, we butcher pronunciations <laughs> left, right, and center. We're, we're always open for corrections. So. Nefandus. That's a very fan like name. I could just say, like, I'm having a band in that. We're Nefandus. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. And then I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pitch in another one here which was in, uh, in fact, the last story we covered with uh, Gavin, Orchidaceous, because I've been slipping that into con- conversation at every available yeah. opportunity. M- might I say you're looking most orchidaceous today? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, such a way with words. <laughs> Just For the very point. same reason, yes. my second uh, word is from the monster of the prophecy is fulgurant. Basically, I've been trying to slip that into conversations. <laughs> it, basically, every story I've written since we did that episode <laughs> has had the word fulgurant in it, which is flashing or dazzling like lightning. Yeah. There's something about it. You can just wrap your tongue around it, can't you? Fulgurant. It, it's yeah. one of those words. It doesn't sound like what it means. No. If you're fulgurant, I think of something that's sort of, I don't know, fruity and <laughs> sort of yeah. green or... Uh, lightning, it doesn't doesn't yeah. seem to connect. It's weird. I just associated with coffee a coffee brand. Yeah, we have a coffee brand <laughs> called Folgers. Yeah, that was ah. that was ah. Ah. Oh, nice. <laughs> the Folgers is Folgerant. Yeah. <laughs> How full? How would a Folgerant for you yes. uh, that it has? <laughs> what else have we got then? A couple more, shall we do? Um, Indeed. I don't know how to pronounce this correctly or not. In Mortatelli's, just work your way through it. And uh, for Scott Mullen's words, I never knew it actually existed for something that you know, like. It was like, you know, the well massive flower range that placed on cemetery graves. Yeah. Yeah, that was a new one on me as well. I have to say, well, like quite a few of these were, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a kind of very Poe type of word, I, I feel. Yeah. I, I live close to a cemetery, so I see them all the time. So you always think about them and like they always stay there so long and like the wind will blow because them are plastic. So like they're everywhere. Mm. <laughs> So now I can play, I can complain about them. Yeah, you can use the right terminology when complaining about them. <laughs> when I write a letter to the editor about him, I can use the correct word for it. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, you use big words and they think you know what you're on about. Yeah, damn right. He's, he's so informed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about you, Richard? You got another one there you want to pick? Yeah. Let me see Come here. That one. What? Corpus Delecti? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely I a band like name, that, yeah. isn't it? That, yeah. 
That is, yeah, that's, that's a solid band name right there. Yeah. No, it is a band name. They're, they're a French goth band from the 1980s. <laughs> oh, uh, right. Yeah, they yeah, really good. They reformed. I went to see them last year. <laughs> they were, yeah, they've been going since the mid-80s, Corpus Electi. Yeah. It's demonian, really? Okay. Yeah. Relating to or having the nature of a demon. Demonian. Okay. <laughs> I'd heard it under different contexts before, but never mind. That sounds like a, like a mispronunciation, like 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 a like a third grader would go like you know, it's demonian. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was just after the Cambrian was the demonian, then the Jurassic. Was that, was that I always get those confused. Yeah. All right, and um, do we have a favourite sort of line or a couple of sentences or something like that? And I, I know that's a big ask because. You could pretty much open any page in this book and pull something out. I feel, but uh... I do. And you again, you get you know exactly <laughs> what I'm going to say. And a hat tip to Mister Gavin Chapel. It's pecuniary depletion from the tale of Satampra Zeros. <laughs> yes, yes. I am in a state of pecuniary depletion. Yeah, I'm skint. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it because it's a lovely little it's a lovely little passage. In our occupation, as in all others, the vicissitudes of fortune are oftentimes to be reckoned with, and the goddess chance is not always prodigal, prodigal of her favours. So it was that Tiruv Ompalios and I, at the time of which I write, have found ourselves in a condition of pecuniary depletion, which, though temporary, was nevertheless extreme and was quite inconvenient and annoying. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Oh yeah, many, many times. Pecuniary depletion was going to be one of my like, phrases that are going to bring up and all that. Mine too. It's, it's my favourite one out of the whole. Love it. Oh, yes, that. that's, like, can, that's my constant state. So you know, <laughs> your default state. <laughs> it's interesting, like um, you know, you have certain phrases that you will forever associate with a certain author like i always associate gibbous moon with hp lovecraft and that's partially because my copy of the outsider had a misprint and it was gibbons moon <laughs> um, so that gave me some interesting images but i will forever think of pecuniary depletion with smith you know it's, it's up there with robert chambers's puffy grave worms <laughs> you know? they're the best sort Oh, yeah, of course. You yeah. don't want those non-puffy ones. Yeah, plump and juicy. Yeah. There was one phrase, like, what unimaginable horror of the protoplastic life for me. Protoplastic just kind of like, it made me think, what is protoplastic? And then, and I does. Like a protoplast is a person or thing that comes first. You know, and I was not thinking, like, I was thinking of plastic, mm. you know, it was like, being like, well, we think of plastic, but it was like something Oh, so it meant something that's completely different by yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. You know, like a, a prototype is something like early human being life. Yeah. That one got me thinking. I was like, I'm just curious what he meant by that. And I like to go down, search the meaning of it. Yeah, because it, it, it wouldn't have had at all the same sort of connotations that it, it does today, does it? We're in the pre-plastic era. I mean, it's a, yeah. 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 I think Bob Bakerlite would back then, wouldn't it? I don't know if, if protoplasm even was a thing back then, was it? Would that, would that have been... Uh... I don't know when these terms would have come into sort of popular use. Well, I think Lovecraft used protoplasm a few mm. times. Oh. Or, or, or that's just my brain thinking, because I've read it so many times describing Shoggoths that I think Lovecraft said it, maybe, maybe yeah. didn't. So. I think I read that in a, I think Jack Kirby used protoplasm, like in some New God stuff or something <laughs> like that. So I'm trying to pull as far as where have I heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those words that like, people really love to use. Yeah. It sounds really cool. Yeah. I wonder sometimes with Smith being a poet as well. Um, I mean, people say this about Tolkien that he really wrote his stories to be read out loud. And I wonder if there was something of that with Smith as well. Because you certainly get quite a lot of uh, alliterations, a lot of these lovely words, fulgurant and effulgent. Uh, I, I just wonder if that was a thing with him. I mean, some of them were prose poems virtually anyway, yeah. really. I think that's one of the things I've um, really got an appreciation from doing this series was his way of describing colour. You know, whereas a lot of writers, 90% of authors will say, and the sky was purple. Smith would say purpureal. <laughs> and that is very poetic, isn't it? Class it up a little bit. Come on. Yeah. Um, 
but that purpurial, I, I don't know, it's just so much more evocative than just saying it was a bit purple. You know? <laughs> it's like that extra bit of lace on the end of a sleeve, isn't it? You know, I just think that's sort of. Indeed. <laughs> oh, now you're talking. Now yeah. you're talking. Yeah. Class the place up a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so let's get in then to what our favourite story out of Volume One is, and why. Why have we chosen that story above the others? Uh, and again, I think overall it's been a really high standard. In, in this, considering these are his first fiction stories as well. Yeah. There's one or two that have dipped down a little bit. So again, I, I don't think this is necessarily an easy choice to make. I would say that, I mean, going into this, my favourite Smith story was The Tale of Satan Zeros, And it is still definitely up there. It's, you know, but um, I don't know. I think it's just because it was one of the first I read and the first that really resonated with me. But aside from that, I I really liked A Night and Malineon. There was just something about that. The dreamlike quality, it was almost like a, I mean, I said at the time, it reminded me of that kind of Silent Hill thing, you know, almost like a, a purgatory kind of aspect to it. I don't know, there's just so much you can dive into with that story. Uh, even though it's what, I mean, it's only about five pages long or something. It's barely more than a prose poem but there's just something about the imagery in that and that funereal sort of pace to it i don't know i just it's one of them that's stuck with me yeah so i've got to say that's got to be up there for me it's definitely a very compact story it definitely has a lot going on for so short mm. and um it, um it does leave a lasting impression when you're done with it and, uh, yeah yeah how about you richard I hadn't had to get a chance to read all of these, but the ones that I did, as far as I really, uh, ones I got this, the two that stood out, or ones that stood out to me, I like Murder in the Fourth Dimension. I, I really enjoyed that one, as far as that goes. And then uh, uh, Devotee of Evil is another one that I, I really, really enjoyed that one as well, as far as that's concerned. I, mean, I had tried to get all of these read before our thing today, but ran out of time, <laughs> as far as that goes. But like, yeah, as far as, you know, that that's it has, is a neat twist as far as, again, I'm on a murder, right? so murder in the fourth dimension, as far as, you know, in terms of um, that, you know, bringing that kind of, like, aspect into it as far as, because it's almost kind of like a conventional you know, crime type of thing as far as, but then bringing in these, again, you know, this supernatural element into it that I thought was really cool. I thought it was amazing that someone hates somebody so much they would invent a, basically a time machine. Yeah, yeah. So they can murder somebody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as far as, yeah, taking your yeah. standard, it's like a murder mystery or crime thing or whatever, and like, okay, let's make this, you know, let's throw our, put our imagination into it. And I, I think that's the thing with Smith. He can take something that you think, oh, this is quite a conventional type story. We're going to see this or that. But he always manages... To, to spin it off in some very strange direction. Yeah. Uh, and, and and stories like that, especially, I think we said at the time, would make great sort of Twilight Zone episodes. They have that kind of feel about them, don't yeah. they? I'm surprised that more of it, particularly after the one after I read it, the, the Clark Ashton cycle and then some of these as far as that they – not very many of them had, you know, been adapted into because you'd think that they're – particularly with the length of them, make themselves – very uh easily adaptable to say again there's kind of like the the strange stories anthology ish type of things your twilight zones and your outer Absolutely. limits and yeah. that kind of thing yeah. that would, you hadn't seen more of these besides return of the sorcerer as far as like oh let's grab this one and adapt it you know as far as that's concerned and and especially because they, they'd be quite sort of um they'd, they'd be effects light as well wouldn't they you you don't really need a lot in terms of filming to, mm -hmm. to adapt a story like that uh so yeah how about you, Mark? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick a really like dark horse one here. Uh Metamorphosis of the World. Uh, that one is probably not his best one, but for some reason it just stuck with me. You know, it just seemed like you know that it, it was almost like he was writing like this tome in 1929 to warn us of what is happening today, you know, about like, like yeah. the world is being destroyed. You know, it's um, and you know when you when after like you know y'all talked about it, I had to go and read it. You know right then and there, and, and it had such a deep impact on me. You know, that, Ooh, yeah. You know, I, I could see everything that was happening as he was describing it, and even hearing the sounds. Yeah, yeah. So you know that just and you know it's like as as far as you know his stories go, it's it's probably not his best, but it definitely left a big impression on me. And, and yeah, quite prescient for its time as well. Uh, 
and is that was it was that the one that's set in 1979 yeah so it, it is weird now looking back at what was the future then <laughs> yeah. i always loved that kind of thing as far as you know was it demolition man or whatever that said in like 1999 or something yeah. like that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah that's right yeah and last year was soil and green yes i forgot about yeah. that oh wow yeah yeah and it isn't blade runner coming up soon or have we already passed that one I'm, mm, I'm not sure. I don't think... no i think we did because they were showing like the replicants birthdays and that kind of thing and Pris's birthday was i want to say you know has happened already mm. as far as she's already been Theoretically, she's already been born, you know, it's more, you know, still got a lot for the sequel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get, we'll, we'll try to get there. <laughs> we'll, we'll hobble up 2049. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Escape, Escape from New York was 1997, wasn't it? And, uh, yeah. We should have had our hoverboards from Back to the Future 2 about five years ago, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> The future is now. <laughs> there's, there's a there's another episode we could do there on the <laughs> science fiction things that came true or are coming true. I guess <laughs> Buck Rogers was like was being like they're doing the comic strips, like you know talking about them and also like you know that they predicted the you know, the Puerto Rican. Oh yeah, I'd forgotten about you know, that. And I don't oh. know if that's really such a marvel technology of now. You know, I suppose that's the the problem with science fiction. I mean, it can date very quickly. But then I suppose the other side of it is they say science fiction is often more about the time it's set in rather than the future in, in that sense. Yeah, because it gives you a window into like this is what at that time, you know, the forecast really was for the future at that point where people thought things were going and whether or not they actually got there is a whole other story. Almost like a warning, you know, like if, if we keep doing this, this is what's going to happen. You know, yeah. so. I think the biggest example is the flip phone from Star Trek, isn't it? <laughs> That's how far we've advanced, folks. <laughs> well, I think even when he was writing science fiction, he was he was writing it with an eye to fantasy in, in that sense. Because, again, all, all the descriptions, particularly with the Venus stories, uh, are incredibly vivid. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, have some elegance to it, please. <laughs> and I think something we said is is monsters are very rarely humanoid type guy in a rubber suit things. He, he always really stretched his imagination to have things with seven legs and a giraffe's neck and <laughs> the wings of a bee or something. And you know. I think that's really quite um, a good point when talking about Smith because his science fiction, it was all kind of rooted in that Edwardian. It was all brass and big tubes and, you know, it was all, it was all almost <laughs> like a HG Wellsian kind of future, wasn't it? It was all, it was all very brass and tweed and plush velvets and things like that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I don't know. It's there's, there's, there's something really attractive about that kind of futurism. It's like you know the reality is gonna it's gonna be really dull, isn't it? It's gonna all be steel and concrete and glass, you know. Give me the velvets and, <laughs> and all the rest of it, brass man. Yeah, it was that one in in one of the um, in the voyage to Savannah Moe that we did recently. You know, the horse with too many legs <laughs> and and mushrooms sprouting from its. Um, uh, that it's, was, it's the orchids. Yeah, yeah, the, or yeah. the orchidaceous horse. Yeah, the orchidaceous horse. Now there's a pub name. <laughs> yeah, we're going there for a drink. Yeah, let's go down the orchidaceous the orchidaceous horse for a couple. Yeah. Two pints of mescaline, please. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to be a bit boring in a way and choose the obvious one, which is uh, Satan Praseros. Yep. Because I think for me, um, I can't remember exactly when I first read it, but I'm pretty sure it would have been about the time we started getting into Dungeons and Dragons, uh, sort of late 70s. And for me, that story above any other story, except maybe Tower of the Elephant by Robert E. Howard, really captures that early D&D &D vibe when we were playing with bits of graph paper and pencils and you had your three dice and a couple mm -hmm. of figures before it all really went, uh, well, I, I suppose complex. I mean, any game can be, our, our role-playing game certainly can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. But there, there was a certain simplicity to it back then and a certain atmosphere. And I think that story captures it perfectly. Yeah. 
But I would also mention Abominations of Yondo as well. If nothing else, well, aside from the language, just as an exercise in world building, because I think, as we said at the time, Smith manages to create a world and a history of this world from very little, just a couple of paragraphs, yet it feels incredibly dense and real and rich. Yeah, Ramsey Campbell mentions it in the introduction. He singles that out as well, that basically in the first paragraph, you've got an entire world. You know, and it, you know, if somebody like Ramsey Campbell is going, yeah, that's that's kind of impressive. <laughs> it's impressive. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, impressive. <laughs> it's kind of impressive. You know what I mean? So uh, now, one thing we haven't really spoken about much so far because we've been covering the stories is how Smith approached his writing, how he got into it, how he actually wrote <laughs> physically in in some ways. Um, so we thought it'd be interesting to take a look at some of that as well, and. Tim mentioned you had something about Smith's typewriter. I do, indeed. Yeah, because we we talked about it on a recent episode, um, whether he typed things up and or wrote it shorthand. Now, there's not a lot in the letters talking directly about his writing process. It's more about, um, I mean, there's a bit I'm going to get into in a minute about his sort of phases. It was like he wrote in phases. He had a, you know, shiny, I'll do that, shiny, I'll do that kind of thing. But I found this lovely little bit because we were wondering. Basically, he had the same way Lovecraft had his commonplace book and would write shorthand ideas. Smith had the black book where he would write shorthand and all the rest of it. But then, yeah, he would then go off and do things, and whether he wrote them out shorthand or not. But anyway, here we go. This is a letter dated May the 23rd, 1933. Dear August, the new machine is a great acquisition. The last three years have been pretty hard on my old Remington, which I bought secondhand more than two decades ago. A machine with fresh type had become an absolute necessity since I intend to prepare some of my work both stories and poems for submissions to book publishers next fall. And not the least advantage is that my carbons will no longer tax the eyesight of my friends. <laughs> so there you go. Nice. nice. I had, um, I had contacted S.G. Josie about Charles question asking, so I figured he would know more than anyone else, you know, did, um, did he type or write? And his response was, well, the answer to your question is complicated. There are plenty of letters by Smith that are handwritten. I can assure you of that because his handwriting is exceptionally hard to read. But there's also lots of type letters. I don't know if he had any rationale for handwriting or typing his letters. The earlier ones to Lovecraft letters are handwritten, but later on are generally typed. Most of the letters to Durlip are typed. I do not, I do not think it can be stated that Love's, uh, Smith's early letters are handwritten and the later ones are typed. Well, there are a fair number of letters in the late 1930s that are handwritten. It may have something to do with whether or not the recipient was a personal friend or more of a literary or personal correspondent. In the latter instance, the letters were generally to be typed. So, right. No, nice. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 So it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. That figures because um, when Rob said that we were going to look into sort of his, his process as a writer and whether how he went about things. It is kind of really, there's no real pattern to it. Sometimes he would just go off and write things in a couple of days. Other times he would spend weeks, months even, agonizing over something and writing notes. Other times he would just completely pants it. It's it's really hard to pin down his process. We do get this. This is in, uh, this is a letter, November 1930. <laughs> and I've got to read the return address for this one because this is one of those we spoke about earlier. So this is to HPL. From the audience room of the throned worm in the knighted kingdom of Anchar <laughs> on the road that is no longer used by living men between Abchaz and Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I'd read a book, just a collection of those. <laughs> I was going to say that that's that's a drabble there, isn't it? <laughs> <That's wonderful. laughs> um, and uh, he wrote to Lovecraft, I hope to hear that you have done some new stories before long. That commonplace book of which you speak must be a fascinating affair. 
I have formed more and more the habit of noting down ideas, since otherwise I tend to forget them wholly or in part. So ah. he, he was keeping notes at some point. That's 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 what I'd got like hints of his black book. Right. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. it was because yeah, it's comp it's in the um, the introduction to the letters of August Sterleth and Clark Ashton Smith. The editor says that about Smith's black book and compared it to Lovecraft's commonplace book. So there you go. Nice. And what's the commonplace book? Did we? Does the copy of that still exist? Well, it's what Derleth wrote all those stories out of. Yeah, you but, know. Yeah. Right, so yeah, the yeah, posthumous. Yeah, things, that's where he yeah. took the ideas from. Whereas as far right, as far as we know, the black book wasn't found or doesn't exist. I think the black book you can find it on um, the Elridge Dark website because I think I've run it a few times. Oh, right, right. And, right. and the that's commonplace nice. book um, has has been reprinted. It's in one of the collection of essays for uh, Lovecraft. Yeah. Yeah, because it's where the snippets that became um, a lot of the posthumous collaborations between August Derleth and Lovecraft come from. Things like Innsmouth Clay and all that kind of stuff. That was uh, that all came out of the commonplace book. And some in some cases, it was literally just like a three line synopsis, wasn't it? Um, that Derleth then yeah. fleshed out. And uh, yeah, it's. I think it's strange that nobody's really done that with uh, Smith's Black Book. I mean, there must be some interesting things in there. Well, I think it's part of that thing where Lovecraft, um, where Smith never got the same recognition as Lovecraft. Yeah, I think it's changing. Yeah. I mean, there are people doing Smithian collections and stories now, or, you know, set in Zothic or Hyperborea, that kind of thing. So I think it's there. I think it's a little bit like the Robert Chambers King in Yellow mythos. It's got attached to Lovecraft, and that's yeah. brought it out into the light which is probably not a good place to, for the King in Yellow to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. No. But um, that has spurred a lot of collections of King in Yellow type stories from, from different authors, yeah. right? So maybe we'll see more of that with Smith as he, uh, well, hopefully we're, we're spearheading a Smith Renaissance. <laughs> You're at the forefront. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's the whole, the whole purpose of this podcast, isn't it? It's uh, just to get it out there. You know, so good. And as far as Smith's writing style goes, I found this, uh, again, another letter to Lovecraft and with yet another lovely return address. <laughs> this one is October 1930. In the world, Sarkolosh at the dawn of the red sun and the setting of the green. That's nice, a world with a red and a green sun going up and down. That's, that's quite an image. Nice. And it's talking about the Whisper in Darkness. I think Lovecraft had just sent him the Whisper in Darkness. As I told you in my last, I think your new tale is among your best. It's a capital example of the theory you advance regarding the composition of weird stories, a theory which is undoubtedly the soundest one possible. My own conscious ideal has been to delude the reader into accepting an impossibility or series of impossibilities by means of a sort of verbal black magic in the achievement of which I make use of prose rhythm, metaphor, simile, tone colour, counterpoint, and other stylistic resources, like a sort of incantation. You attain the black magic, perhaps unconsciously, in your pursuit of corroborative detail and verisimilitude. But I fear that I don't always attain verisimilitude in my pursuit of magic. However, I sometimes suspect that the wholly unconscious elements in writing are by far the most important. So I think it's a it's an interesting contrast in some ways between Lovecraft and Smith because Lovecraft has this uh, reputation for never describing anything and, you know, everything's unnameable. And un but he actually describes quite a lot and he goes into quite a lot of detail. Mm. And Smith, I feel it's more dreamlike Absolutely. perhaps than Lovecraft. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's about accurate. That's probably one reason why I have a hard time with Dark Ash and Smith, you know, uh, seems to me H.P. Lovecraft tried to ground things in reality to try to make them as people as possible. And I don't, didn't seem like Clark Chester Smith was concerned with reality. He wanted to make things kind of, you know, as like, you know, as, as um, you know, as a dreamlike or fantasy, fantasy like as possible for a story and not try to make it any type of, you know, setup for it. And, 
Yeah, because a lot of those are kind of hit the ground running in these very alienish type of you know worlds and that type of thing, or like odd you know skate you know uh, environments and that type of thing, and people that are you know you could certainly say are unrelatable as far as you know a pair of necromancers and you know that kind of <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to yeah like you said as far as uh, Lovecraft would have like the, your point of view character who's essentially you know your investigator or you know that kind of thing as far as and he's the one walking into this new environment or like learning and you know these horrors or that kind of thing so that kind of can make it a little for somebody yeah, just picking one up off the street or whatever to read a little easier more easily accessible yeah i'd say lovecraft was probably more visceral whereas smith was probably more metaphysical if that makes any <laughs> sense whatsoever <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> It's great well, it's interesting comparing across the three again where you've got blood and thunder with with bob oh, <laughs> you know, where, uh, everything is is body parts being hacked off and, and stuff like that but then also with that element of horror you know i, I think it is like i mean lovecraft's characters are just vehicles for us to experience the, the cosmic horror i think most of the time mm-hmm. uh, and smith sort of falls somewhere between the two i think there's not a lot of character necessarily but the ones there are, are very finely drawn I think uh, you, you get quite a good sense of the person. I mean, especially things like Satan Praziros. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into the into the pseudo sequel, the theft of the thirty nine girdles, because that's one of my favourites. I mean, that that could be a carry on film. <laughs> like seriously, I mean, it's one of the it's like Smith doing high farce. And uh, I think that is, I think it is a shame that he didn't do more with that, that character because, I mean, he could have had a Conan on his hands there. You know what I mean? If he'd, uh, well, actually more Fafid and Grey Mouser. Yeah. If he'd have, if he'd have gone down that route with, with Satan Braziros, I mean, yeah, I think we'd be looking at a very different landscape when it comes to sword and sorcery. And, and surely that story must have been a huge influence on Liber. In, in inventing his characters. Well, I think it's telling that on the back of the Lost Worlds, um, the Hyperborea one, um, that it's, it's actually a quote from Liber. You know, I so... You know, yeah. And I think this is something we touched on before, uh, Smith's view of fantasy as well. He, he was, although he wrote those science fiction stories, he wasn't particularly into the science aspect. Scientific fiction. Science fiction, yeah. I love that word. It's great, isn't it? It's a shame we don't use that anymore, man. I mean, I love that science fiction. Great. But then um, someone said to me, but is it science fiction or is it scientific fiction? And that, I, I, I can't quite get it right sense. in my head now. <laughs> I was going to say, did your brain melt? <laughs> yeah. You can see why they changed it to sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> so this is October 1930, another letter to Lovecraft. As for the problem of fantasy, my own standpoint is there is absolutely no justification for literature unless it serves to release the imagination from the bounds of everyday life. I have undergone a complete revulsion against the purely realistic school, including the French, and can no longer stomach even Anatole France. God knows what I can find to read after I have exhausted the last of your reloaned manuscripts. So again, it's that notion of he's, he's very consciously creating dreamscapes and dreamlike stories and prose poems, uh, almost regardless of the market, perhaps, uh, even though he, he started writing really to make some money. <laughs> it was uh, in that state of funerary depletion <laughs> just outside uh, <laughs> I mean, California. I mean, we see that a lot in his letters um, concerning Farnsworth Wright, don't we? How much he decries what he considers the sort of the run of the mill stuff that gets put in weird tales. Whereas, you know, we've talked about this many times, haven't we, Rob? It's like Mm. um, his stories were too weird for weird tales, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Which is mind-boggling, isn't it? They want some weird tales, but not that weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa, whoa, yeah. I said weird. Not, but, not, not like that. <laughs> yeah. But what do you guys think about this as well? It's something we yeah. say. These were pulp magazines. They're not being being read in salons. <laughs> They're not being discussed in, in high society. Yeah, exactly. Yet they yeah. endure, and they're more popular now than ever, these authors. Yeah, they definitely have. Like, they're more iconic in mm-hmm. this day and age, and a lot of people are kind of like, you know, like, 
have like almost like, almost really say nostalgia, but you know, there's definitely like a, a deep reverence for them, the stories. Even though they may have read them, they may have just know my reputation. And they may just like, you know, just have a deep love for them. And especially when they have like the art, the covers and stuff like that. You know, I, I do love the, um, mm -hmm. I do love finding some of the old weird tales there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad a lot of them are posted online so I can just go online, you know, and, and turn off one of the stories and read them then. Yeah, we recently did a um, live launch party for um, the Lovecraftiana magazine's um, issue that commemorated the first issue of Weird Tales. And to do that, I, I ended up pulling up the first ever like cover of Weird Tales, and it was absolutely magnificent. You had this man and the, the man had a knife, and the woman sort of doing the pearl white scream thing, and there was this great big sinewy <laughs> tentacle wrapped around her leg. And then just behind her in shadow was this like head with <laughs> eyes. And it but it had these little round ears that it looked like a bear. And I couldn't work out whether the bear was watching <laughs> or the bear had tentacles. <laughs> Either way, it was brilliant. <laughs> For interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Like, that Winnie the Pooh has let himself go. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Paddington goes nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But then I suppose the other side of that and something we've spoken about before, I mean, Dickens was writing for Penny Dreadfuls and serialisations. Wasn't Conan Doyle doing serialisations for... Uh... Strand magazine, wasn't it, Conan Doyle? Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. one of the one of the best ones was um, Ambrose Bierce writing for that Scandal magazine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah when we covered The Damned Thing, it was first published in this magazine. That I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it was um, a Scandal mag. It basically, like, the equivalent of Heat or one of these celebrity magazines, and it was like, who's getting with who and in high society, who you know, all these kind of like, <laughs> I saw him with her that night kind of thing. And then you got Ambrose Bierce talking about invisible monsters killing people <laughs> in a swamp. <laughs> it's just, yeah, brilliant. The other good example was Stephen King when he had to make some money in his early days. Mm. And he made his money by writing stories for Playboy. Yeah. Yeah. So sure. there you go. Tennessee Williams, you know, he did a few writing for Weird Tales as well. Yeah, before he became Tennessee Williams. I, ju I just wonder who's the arbiter yeah. of that, who decides if something is worthy of scholarship or it's just sort of discarded as, you know, nonsense. Uh, because there's a huge amount of Lovecraft scholarship, as we know now. Well, and the same for Robert E. Howard, and, and I'm sure for Smith as well, to some extent. Absolutely. It depends on how popular you are. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who does decide? It's strange, isn't it? Who decides that's literature? that's pulp mm. you know it, yeah and does the scholarship come with the increase in popularity or does it lead it or you know because wasn't lovecraft huge in france uh quite early on i think there's there's quite a lot of scholarship in france about him I'm not sure off the top of my head but um it seems to ring a bell yeah i, I don't know if that's off the back of yeah the, the sort of uh surrealist mm. movement and and that kind of thing i think I think uh, there was a little bit in France, but I think he was bigger in, in Britain. Yeah. Um, mm. is that, I think that he had um, some articles. Like one of his stories was published in a magazine. I think we were still alive. I'm trying to remember. and um, But I do believe that he had a few things published in Britain. Or he wanted to be printed. There was always that countless moment with Lovecraft where it was kind of like, you know, he was going to get that opportunity to get something printed. Yeah. You know, like he's, and it always, you know, pull out from under him, you know, like a future collaboration with Houdini. Probably would have done wonders in his career, but Houdini had had the nerve and die on him, you know. So, I mean, consider it. So yeah. rude. Yeah. Well, the classic was um, Shadow Over Innsmouth, wasn't it? That you had that printed and it was a complete yeah. mess. And I mean, Rob and, Rob and I, have, we've, we've both been in publications that haven't come out the way we hoped. <laughs> you know, I think most authors have. But I mean, for Lovecraft, he's got this, he's finally going to get a single you know, he's finally going to get his own standalone release and it's a complete and total dog's breakfast, you know. Such a such a shame, but, you know. And the shunned house too. Um, one of his friends was going to print the shunned house as a book for him, but his wife died and that just, that destroyed his life and he didn't want to do anything. But he had he had it printed, but he didn't have it bound. Yeah. And so he had all these copies of unbound books, you know, that didn't get done until like, you know, long after Lovecraft had died. Wow, that's sad. August Derlick was the one who did that. He finished that. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. It's it's sad that he never really saw that in his lifetime, and I guess uh, Bob Howard as well. And you think Clark Ashton Smith uh, would have at least have seen some of his success? I mean, the the, the sort of paperback surge in the sixties and seventies, he, he must have seen some of that. Uh, I, I don't know how much he would have earned from it, given the way that contracts and all that kind of thing work. But, uh... Well, we can we can look into that because obviously a lot of it was actually published by Arkham House, and we've got mm. the the letters with Derleth, and a lot of like the later letters are concerning these um, publications because oh, right. this was at the yeah, it's something I want to get into when we do another one of our um, patron episodes with the letters, sure. and um, but the thing is this was when Smith wasn't writing and you know, his fiction writing had basically just stopped and Derleth is like, dude, people keep asking me for stories. What have we got? And that's when we got like reprints of some of these stories. Um, that's what we, we talked about with the dud. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, that was, that was one of those that Derleth was like, look, weird tales want a story from you send me something and i can get yeah. you some money and um yeah that's just kind of how it went at that point it is kind of sad that he didn't write much you know because like after lovecraft died you know that he um it seemed like if he kept yeah. writing that maybe you know he might have found you know that that one thing that would have resonated with everybody and made him like the household name like of of howard and yeah. lovecraft yeah have had that character or maybe he would have continued to open it with one of the characters you know that know the story and then he like got into like you know rock carving yeah. you know for a period yeah he was sculpting and painting wasn't it became a became a thing it was uh i don't know if it was in the same year but certainly around the same time that his, his parents got very ill and died and lovecraft died and howard died and i guess it must have been an extremely depressing time for him that you know he was having to work in the fields doing manual labor just to just to get some money in and he had his own underlying health issues as well, which, mm. um, you know, which, I mean, he was plagued by ill health, like pretty much all of his life, wasn't he? It's, uh, he wasn't exactly the most robust kind of chap. But um, I think um, in this eccentric Impractical Devils, the letters with Derleth, in the introduction by S.T. Joshi, there's, um, I think this sums it up nicely, that Smith worked in phases in which he primarily explored one medium more than the others, but not exclusively. When he exhausted one, he worked earnestly in another. He seems to, you know, and that's basically, I think, sums up his mindset. He would work tirelessly on something because early on it was all poetry. And then he threw himself into fiction. And then he threw himself into the sculpture. I guess, I guess he, he, he reached a wall, maybe? I don't know, I'm just speculating here, but, you know. It's that difficult third album, you think? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, the difficult third album. I mean, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the thing, isn't it? You know? So are you going to do your music-themed episode? There was a, one of the most more recent episodes you guys were talking about. You're going to do a specialty episode about music inspired by clark ashton smith's you know stories and that type of thing because i know that lovecraft really has almost become its own genre in music at this point because you've got bands that just like not only really write a song about lovecraft but have their whole persona and aesthetic is about him they're the great old ones and necronomicon and all these other ones as far as but i wasn't sure i didn't know if yeah similarly if the clark ashton smith had a similar is that there was as many you know like um uh, bands and that type of thing that were you know uh, inspired or wrote wrote songs about his music there are a few. There. Yeah, there is a few. Yeah, I think there, there's enough to to warrant doing a, a special on it. And I mean, it, I think again, it's similar to the King in Yellow stuff, which once you start looking at that, it's quite surprising how far that spreads out as well in terms of music and well, obviously True Detective and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's definitely something we're we're going to be looking at. We were yeah, thinking true. of a special on adaptations, but then. Well, that'd probably only take one, wouldn't it? Given there's so few, we can we can look at Return of the Sorcerer, and uh, I suppose that Mother that Mother of Toads is is worth talking about actually, because that was quite a good adaptation. It was actually really good. I really enjoyed that. I thought that was a. Uh, it, it's a shame that it wasn't just released on its own as a as a kind of short. Yeah. Because the rest of that film was 
bobbins. <laughs> I'm sorry, it, it really was. It was absolute bobbins. I'm sorry. <laughs> What well, adaptations you can go like in the Marvel comics? They did a lot during the seventies and some of Clark Ashton Smith stuff. Ah, now there's an idea. Oh, yeah, right. I just hadn't thought of that. Oh, yes. And uh, y'all talked about uh, all the ways uh, Clark Ashton Smith killed, you know, Lovecraft and his stories. Oh, no, that's something we're going to do with the um, with the Insmith Book Club. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've been working on it for a while. Um, the, like the the, uh, the deaths of H.P. Lovecraft, we're going to go through <laughs> as many of us as we can. Because because Block killed him, Durlith killed him, Belknap Long killed him, um, One Dry killed him, <laughs> Smith killed him two or three times, <laughs> and then even later you've got like Pugmire killed him. Uh, you know, wait, it's I... in uh, Robert Anton Wilson, the Illuminatus, the character. Oh, yes, the... yeah, you know, there's, there's been a f- Lovecraft's book. There's there's yeah. one where he's a detective or something with someone, I, I can't remember. There's there's quite a lot of stories where Lovecraft appears as a character. Now. Oh, that's that's fairly. Oh, is that Nick Mamatas? Um, I Providence, I'm not sure, I can't remember the uh, name of it. Oh, I can't remember. It's uh, yeah, it's quite recent, quite recent. I say, I say that. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about 20 years, but that's recent to me. You know? <laughs> that, that time dilation will get you. Yeah. Mate, it's still the 80s in my head. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that about wraps us up for season one. Season two, obviously, we're moving to the next volume in the series, The Daughter Saturn. And uh, just to give you a little idea of what we're going to be covering, the stories or some of the stories we'll be covering, we're going to start with the daughter Saturn, and uh, we've got some real favourites in here as well: Rendezvous in Averroin, the Ghoul, the Kingdom of the Worm, the Return of the Sorcerer, which was adapted for TV, something we'll no doubt be looking at, and the the City of the Singing Flame. That was another favourite as well. Oh yeah, yeah, the Hunters from Beyond is another one of mine. I mean, Daughter of Saturn is a favourite. Um, like you say, pretty much all the ones you mentioned are, yeah, absolutely brilliant. But yeah, The Hunters from Beyond, there was something about that I remember. I can't remember the plot of it off the top of my head, but I remember reading it and I remember going, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the ones in that Clark Ashton cycle that stuck out to me because that was in there and that's one of the ones yeah, that, uh, that stuck out to me as well. Yeah, yeah The City of Singing Flame is one of my favourites. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great story, and that got a weird Tales cover, I think, as well, didn't it? That one, there was quite a trusting, quite an iconic picture of that. Oh, it might have been Astounding magazine, perhaps. Yeah, one of one of them. Yeah, yeah. Something I'm looking forward to, um, because one of my favourites is Return of the Sorcerer. I mean, that's a that's just a great Cthulhu mythos story. Um, but in the appendices, um, similar to the Satyr that we we covered, there is an alternative ending which I don't think I've ever read. So that'll be interesting to look because we did that before, didn't we? When we we got to... Yes, the Saturn had the different ending. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so that'll be really interesting to see. Okay, so that's what we've got coming up in season two. Just before we get there, we're going to do a patron special next. We're going to be going through some of the letters between Lovecraft, Smith and Derleth and pulling out a few choice quotes and subjects to talk about then we'll have a short break and then we'll be cracking in to season two so there we go our first season we're we're very pleased to note that we hit over 1500 downloads uh, a few weeks back so we'd like to give a big thanks to everyone who's listened to the show everyone who supported it all our guests all our readers and of course a big thank to our patrons And I'm going to try and do this in one (laughs) breath, so here we go. A big thank you to Chris Carr, Sharon Safia, Rick Seam, Lee Clark Zumpa, Nick Lorimer, Justin Woodman, Russell Journey, Wingate Stites, Lane Mullin, Steve Meyer, Aaron Vleck, Brett Kramer, Benjamin Slade, Gary Pennington, A.T. Johnson, David A. Riley, Rob Weaver, and David Gurney. Bravo. (laughs) <laughs> Bravo! That, that was almost Trevor McDonald levels of reading there. <laughs> and here's Tim with the weather. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to get me pointy stick out? It's going to be fulgurant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, if you'd like to join our patrons in supporting the show, do check out our Patreon page. 
you can sign up at three three tiers of membership <laughs> we've been saying for the last month or so we're going to be uh, rejuggling and rejiggling the tiers and <laughs> we will be doing it soon but um basically you get bonus content for strange shadows and the innsmouth book club and you get a copy of innsmouth news and various other bits and pieces as well free entry to all our events including the innsmouth literary festival september the 30th bedford uk put it in your diary folks nice yeah see that's a reason to sign up right there isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely all right so a huge thanks to our guests mark and richard thanks for coming on guys it's a pleasure to meet you I had an orchidaceous time yeah thanks thing. for having us <laughs> <laughs> nice one Brilliant. nice one and with that it's goodbye from me rob Poynton. and it's goodbye from me tim mendes 